Kim, it's been it's been tough, right? <laughs> it's been a week. <laughs> <laughs> a week. It's been six days, but it feels like fourteen. Oh, it really does, doesn't it? A lot it's, of stuff's uh, happened. Yeah, yeah, but it's been good. It's always good. If it wasn't, if it wasn't good, we wouldn't do it, right? Absolutely. I mean, life, if, if nothing else, is about being enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, very much so. But like, let's let's have a bit of a reflection on last week's. I think wasn't it the first live that we actually did to reflect on the week last week? Was that the first one that we did? <laughs> It was. It was. It was our. It was our first live, and we already done the clubhouse one as well. So we did. We did that, didn't we? And um, I think we just turned the camera on and went for it. It's probably yeah, the, wasn't the best way. But we need to be kind to ourselves, right? Because to be fair, you had had your COVID jab like what two two days before, or one day, no, one day before, right? Yeah. You'd had that jab, yeah. Yeah, it would be less than 24 hours. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, whilst, yes, we need to prepare more, we need to kind of give ourselves a little bit of slack from time to time about being mean to ourselves, right? Because I think we have a tendency to beat ourselves up, yeah? When we, when we don't achieve what we want to achieve, we're kind of a bit mean to ourselves, right? Yeah, and I guess that's why we started the Reflections of the Week, because we don't often give ourselves time, do we, to reflect on the things that have gone well, as well as reflect on the lessons that we've learned. And so that's kind of our purpose for doing these, is to create a space where hopefully people will come and join us and share with us what they've achieved and what they've learned, so that we can all take that moment to be kind to ourselves and each other. Yeah, very much so. But I mean, when you were when you were managing all these sales teams and managing all these huge projects, right? You used to do this every week with your team, right? Like when you were when you were managing like hundreds of millions of of, of dollars worth of business, you would reflect, wouldn't you, on a Friday? Is that is that is that what you used to do? Yeah, sure so, to me. yeah so I've been doing reflections of the week for coming up for twenty years, I think, because often when you're running those big teams, it was that opportunity to be able to share. What had happened that had gone well for people, what we'd learnt. And also often, you know, I would be out and about and the team wouldn't necessarily know what you were doing all of the time. So it was a great way of being able to share with them what was happening. You know, at one point I was running five sites. So actually, when you weren't in that particular site, they didn't know what was happening, but you wanted to make sure that they stayed connected and that you were taking some time to give of yourself, because I think that's really important in leadership. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. So so basically with with these reflections of the week, right, we're actually going to be taking guests. So if anyone's kind of listening to this and they want to jump on and be a guest and like actually discuss, you know, what they have done, what they've achieved during the past week, that would be great. But I think, you know, what what we did sort of miss last week was when uh, when Jonathan Chase kind of pulled pulled us up on the sort of on the clubhouse we were doing. He kind of said, well, you know, this has happened in the UK this week this is what's going on in the world and i think that's something that we kind of had missed a little bit in last week because we didn't really have a chance to prepare because we were so busy um so i think this week if we if we sort of you know let's let's look at the reality of of the world right now i mean like we've got easter coming up um tomorrow right um you've got people in italy and france and everywhere else that have and the uk right that have been announced lockdowns i don't know what's what's going on where you are lockdown wise yeah well we're about to um head in hopefully um to the first phase of things being opened up a little bit more so obviously the kids have gone back to school albeit right now they're um broken up again for easter but assuming that there's no further um spike and at the moment it seems that there isn't then on the 12th of April, so a week on Monday. Is that right? Fortnight on Monday. Um, well, no, week on Monday. We will be able to um, go into um, bars and restaurants uh, outside and sit and eat. Um, so although we're still not able to go and meet each other and be in each other's homes, I think people are starting to really feel that uplift that says actually there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And also, obviously, the vaccines are going brilliantly. We've got over half the um, country now vac or at least had their first jab so I think that again it gives us hope and as we've discussed often the only thing greater than fear is hope and I think that is really having that uplifting impact on people all around 
Yeah, very much so. I mean, over here in Croatia, where I'm at, um, you know, bars and restaurants have been open for, I think, over a week now. Um, and and actually, the thing is, is that they are closing early. So, you know, we're kind of restricted to close uh, at 10 p.m., which is interesting. And in addition, the music in um, bars is actually limited to a specific volume because apparently that that in itself could cause more COVID cases. So I imagine they've probably followed some European kind of regulations right around that. Um, but, you know, it's... Um, it, it has, it's not it's not easy for anyone. I mean, I've got friends, like I posted on Facebook the other day, I've got a friend in Italy who's kind of stuck. Uh, she can't go out. She's she's very frustrated. Um, Maria, bless her. Um, so that's, that's really tough for her. I've got a friend who's in Peru. She's actually moved house because she, she basically was living in Lima um, in the capital. And uh, she went out for a jog and the police actually took her into jail and they put her into a cell for like three hours. This was a, yeah, this was a couple months back, right? And so she basically has just moved house. She's moved to nearer to the coast when there are less people. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's really very difficult for some people. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. And in America, they've announced today that they're actually... Um, some states are, are, are taking away the restrictions on um, wearing masks in public, which is a bit preemptive, if you ask me. Yeah, no, I think that. I don't know. I guess, I guess we've just got to. We've been in this for so long now. I think we've just got to make sure that we take sensible steps, and and we've got to do the things that we think are right, aren't we? Um, and everyone's got a different opinion on that. Um, and I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of um, anger and frustration from people who have differing opinions about whether it's masks or the vaccine or what we should and shouldn't be doing. And I think it reminds me that actually, you know, it's absolutely fine for us to disagree. But I think what we need to be mindful of is whilst it's okay to disagree, it's not okay to disrespect and everybody is entitled to their opinion and their choices. And even if they're different to ours, we need to understand those and not vilify people for them, I think. Yeah, very much so. But I mean, in terms of kind of where we're at and what we've been doing, it's been frustrating. The past week or two has been very frustrating, um, you know, because we're launching our monthly membership program, which we can't talk too much about because we don't want to dampen the enthusiasm around it. Um, but we've had some teething problems, right, with videos and copywriting and, you know, so we don't want to cause like a lack of interest. Yeah. So we can't really talk too much about it. But so we've we've decided to kind of postpone um, to give you know postpone giving people information around that until we've got a proper launch date right. So that's been very difficult, like managing our emotions. Certainly from my point of view, and working with you the past week has been amazing to actually kind of go through that impatient emotion of like, well, you know, I, I want this to happen now. Like it, it must happen now. It's got to happen now. And turning around and going, well, it's ready when it's ready kind of thing. Cause it's kind of like an artist. Yeah. Like when, when it's ready, it's going to be ready and it's going to launch and it's going to go. Right. But you're not going to release a wine until it's ready. And you're not going to release a movie. Are you until it's edited properly? And you're certainly not going to release a lousy paper or a course, you know? Yeah. No, and I think it is. It's that piece around. It's it's that fine balance, isn't it? Around making sure that you channel that impatience into proactive activity to be able to keep moving you forward, but actually not allow it to detract from what it is that you're trying to do. Because what you don't want to do is rush something out and end up with it not actually helping people, not supporting people, because that's the purpose. And I think that's been the thing that we've probably had to um, tackle this week. I and mean, also we've had to learn like new skills, haven't we, and new software and navigate our way around those. And, you know, that can be that, that can be frustrating. And I, I know certainly for me, like last week, I think it was on Thursday, I really struggled. One, I didn't realise that probably I was a little bit tired from having the jab and hadn't done what everybody says you should do and take some time out and just relax. So I didn't. I did my usual thing of going, well, come on, it'll be fine. Let's just get on with it. So I did lots of uh, lives did loads of interviews because they were already planned in but then also had to do some work on my website which is not where I get my joy I, I'm it's not <laughs> the thing I um, love doing so I can do it I've learned how to do it 
but it really frustrates me. So when I'm when I'm struggling from an energy point of view, going and doing something that doesn't give me energy feels really, really hard work. And though, even though it needed to be done, and sometimes we have to do things whether we want to do them or not, just because they need doing, but it was recognizing that actually that doesn't give me joy. So how do I make sure that I intersperse it with things that do give me joy um, so that I can re like re energize myself um and ensure that i don't actually just want to throw my laptop out of the window which you know i wanted to do a couple of times last week and the uh, at the end of it well that's why i'm grinning that's totally why i'm grinning pity loves a party right and i'm certainly not going to help you to focus on how much you hate building websites <laughs> or messing around with them right like i feel your pain believe me yeah but but you know, it, it's it's typical your style, right? Multitasking until you just like can't. Like I, I watched you, and because you've been doing all this facial facial recognition kind of training around coaching and stuff, like I've picked up a few tips, and just to watch to what I could almost watch your brain working when you were trying to multitask, and I almost watched like the cops just sort of just go. <laughs> And just stop moving. Do you know what I mean? And I, it was it was a really interesting um, week. Like just really interesting, yeah. To to observe uh, that was was fascinating. And like the learning process that we're basically going through right now has been has just been it's been incredibly interesting. And in particular, like this 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 AI writing software that we've been exploring has been absolutely fascinating really oh, it is it's my it's mind-blowing isn't it that the um just what it can do and how it can take kind of what you're thinking and just give you more ideas and you know remove that writer's block and you know we're both obviously you know writing our books and trying to get those trying to get those finalized and we set ourselves those those targets and you're know, proud to say that we kind of got there um albeit they need editing and they need to be refined and that but just having gone through that process and, and that moment of, of saying you know if you'd have told me uh, if you'd have told me even six months ago that I would be able to write anything that over 30,000 words I would have thought you were a crazy person <laughs> yeah just done it um, and there's that real moment of like achievement where you go yeah I did it I set myself a goal one I didn't think I knew how to do and yes it was difficult and there were moments where I had no idea what I was going to say next, but you kind of keep going, don't you? And you keep geeing each other up and spurring each other on. And I think that's been one of my big learns over the last six months is finding your, finding your support party. So finding the people that are going to be there with you to make things happen. And that's why I'm loving working with you and with John and with um, Lisa on all the things that we've got coming out because actually we're really spurring each other on and we're sharing different skill sets it's that piece around saying focus on the things that you're good at with the things that bring you joy that make your soul sing and then find people who are good at the things that don't <laughs> make your soul sing but that do make theirs and collectively you'll be so much stronger and you'll have a laugh along the way because I think that's one of the things that we sometimes miss certainly in corporate life I know you know I often used to have people um that would be concerned that you couldn't make like you couldn't make work fun and I don't totally disagree even when I used to have you know 150 million pound target I still made it fun because it's the only way to get through a target like that is to try and enjoy yourself along the way if not it just feels too hard yeah very much so and I like the way that you know, we kind of hit a roadblock and then it's like, well, OK, we've got this International Imposter Syndrome Awareness Day coming up. Right. So let's just switch our efforts and focus on that. And like the way that we just pivoted from one task, which has, is waiting for someone else to another task, which is like, well, this is actually very relevant to what we're doing with the other business thing. So it's like, actually we're not we're not diverting our energy and focusing on things like i may have done a year ago or a couple of years ago and been a bit all over the place this is clearly in parallel around what we're already doing right but yeah i've got something really interesting to, to read you okay so <clears throat> excuse me so basically this is a story that i that i wrote using the ai software 
for my book. So I've already written my book, okay? Yeah. And I, I kind of had reached about 8,500 words. And I was like, actually, I'm going to add in a little bit of a story into it, okay? So I thought I'm going to use this creative tool and I'm going to create a story, right? So I'm going to read you what this, what this tool wrote, okay? And I've hardly edited this. So let me tell you a story about Fred. I just don't know what to do next. As he said these words, his voice was filled with pain and emotion. He had lost everything from his business to his wife. There wasn't a single thing left that he could hold on to. The only thing that kept him going was the feeling of being in control of something again. What am I doing wrong? He looked around at the concrete walls trying to figure out how this happened. He walked over towards an old rusty fire escape door where he used to exit for a cigarette break when things got too tense inside. It seemed like so long ago now, as if it were another life entirely where happiness really existed and not just in moments, but all day, every day. Even though Fred had lost everything, his family business had gone down the drain and he was now a single father with no prospects. He started drinking more than usual at first to try and blot out the hurt, which might have helped for some time, but eventually became something else entirely, an addiction. After the alcohol ran out, the depression hit him like a ton of bricks. The reality that things weren't going to be easy sank in hard and deep. Life was tough, but he loved his son. He knew they would get through this together. He couldn't quite pull it all of it together yet, and he wasn't sure what was next, but he had faith. He felt himself slipping away as he watched another Christmas Eve come around without any gifts under the tree or any joy on his face because there were no visitors and there was no money for alcohol. That one Christmas morning, he woke up with a voice in his head. You are a survivor and you'll get through this. Growing up, he always saw his dad do the same thing, framing life with his glass half full. We would be sitting down at the dinner table and he'd say, Freddie, what are you going to be when you grow up? And Fred would answer with something like a lawyer or a firefighter. His dad would encourage him no matter what he said he wanted to do. He was a great man and he had his way of making Fred feel that anything was possible. That's why it broke Fred's heart to see him on his deathbed in terrible pain because of cancer. It killed him just watching him suffer so much. All these years later, and still his words ring true. You're a winner, Fred, and can achieve anything. But at that moment, they rung hollow inside him because there was nothing left for him or his boy to spend on Christmas. I could go on, but... I will stop there and just think, right, that 95% of that was written by a machine. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, some of the things that it's amazing what technology can, can do. And I don't know, I like, I like the, the part of the story but around actually we can achieve anything if we frame our lives to be looking at it from our glass being half full. And I think sometimes we, we miss the point when we say, you know, our glass is either half full or half empty. The point is it's refillable. So it doesn't matter if it's half full or half empty. The point is we can still fill it. It's a cup. What we've got to do is focus on that. And it reminds me also of the um, John Lennon quote from his mother when I believe he was five or something and was at school. And they gave him the task of assignment of what are you, you, know, what are you going to be? when you grow up and he came back with happy and the teacher said you've misunderstood the assignment and he responded with you've misunderstood life and I think that's so true that is what we're here to do is be happy and when we look at things from a viewpoint of where's the positive then actually more positive things happen to us because we can't have a rainbow without the rain very much so very much so I'm dying to read the rest shall I read the rest of it Shall I read the rest of it? Because it's a really good story, yeah? It's really good, seriously. Shall I? You want to, love. It's brilliant, honestly. I, 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 I literally, it probably took me about 
20 minutes to write this literally that's 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 what's happening in the copywriting industry right now like in with stories and story writing storytelling all that it's it's uh it's amazing yeah so let me see okay so yeah this is this is really cool so basically fred and his boy found themselves at the vicar's house for christmas dinner there was tom who'd been in jail for many years and gary and many other new born again christians all with interesting stories to tell they ate and drank and made merry, and all their problems seemed very far away. This was the time everything changed for Fred and his boy, and they began to get their lives on track. So if Fred can rebuild his life and become a winner again, even after losing everything, then so can you. And, uh, yeah, this book is dedicated to the broken. You can do it. And like I said, you're not alone in being unhappy. It happens. I love it. And it's true. It's that we're not alone. We are we all have the opportunity to be happy and we all have the things that make us sad. And I think it's about being kind to ourselves in those moments where we're feeling sad, that it's okay to be sad, but actually trying to therefore find something that helps us to stop being sad. I mean, as you know, at one of my most melodramatic points of my life where something went disastrously wrong my coping mechanism was to cry for five hours every night, but in between my daughter's feeds. And so nobody knew. It wasn't the greatest coping mechanism. But actually what I needed to do was be able to let out that emotion, to give myself permission to be sad for a period. But it's about finding a way of ensuring that that sadness doesn't take over. Yeah, it's, um, it's a strange, strange world we live in. Where you can, where you can, where you can basically just learn anything that you want to learn, right? Like, and 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 the issue that I don't know, I've certainly faced, and many other people have, is is basically an overload of information that is, in fact, stuff that you really don't even need to know. Like things that that actually you can kind of delve into a topic, and you can go into this topic, but but actually, like reflecting over the week, yeah, like. A lot of the information and the things that we're doing, it isn't new, right? It isn't new, but it's but it's like taking that information that we've kind of learned and refining it and using it to like manage our emotions. Yeah. And like that's that for me, that's the biggest lesson the past week is actually managing expectations and managing emotions for me. That's my personal takeaway, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, and I think it's true. I mean, yeah, we 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 go through life gathering knowledge, but actually knowledge is only powerful if we share it. And it's not just about having it, it's about understanding it and actioning it. If we actually did half of the things we knew how to do, we'd literally astound ourselves. And some of it is because we don't take time to stop and reflect. And that's one of the reasons for doing these reflections is for us to be able to say, actually, what have we learned in this last week? What have we implemented? What have we actioned? that we can say that actually moved us forward. And it might be something we've known for years, but we've not done anything with it before. And it's in making sure that we find that space to not just gather the knowledge, but to actually use it and to share it, to be able to hopefully help other people that need to learn that knowledge too, to help them. Because all of that, that taking that time to reflect really helps us to refill that cup, to make sure that we are constantly staying top up and i think in the way the world is at the moment it's important that we do that yeah very much so and i think looking looking back over the week i think it's it's is that we've actually had a great a great week right and you know we've 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 booked um uh, booked two people to be on the panel with you around imposter syndrome two two fantastic ladies uh, melissa over melissa sassy over at ibm and uh, donna sark car i think i always seem to i always struggle with getting her name right no matter no matter what i do it's the spelling of it <laughs> but um you know um, um, donna's at, uh, at microsoft she actually launched uh, the windows insider program i believe and you know so we've we basically this this imposter syndrome day that we're doing is going to be fantastic and it's going to help a lot of people and you've been busy like putting this course together. I've been writing my book. I'm nearly finished. You've written your book that you finished. And it's like, but those goals that we set ourselves two weeks, three weeks ago, they didn't exist. Right. And then we were like, well, you know, 
let's up the pace and put these new goals in place. And actually, whilst I don't like goals, like they keep they keep your brain focused on what you want to achieve, right? And the outcome that you want to uh, you want to achieve, yeah. Well, yeah, because as we know, you know, from from all the studies that we've done, that our subconscious brain is our happiest little helper, and our subconscious brain is the thing that gets things moving. But it needs to have a direction. It needs to know where we're going. You know, we wouldn't set off. Uh, on a journey without a destination in mind because how would we know which way to go um so you have to kind of set that direction you have to say this is where i'm heading now, i might not know how i'm going to get there but actually i at least know where i'm pointing myself where it is that i'm trying to go and i think we probably as we've demonstrated as soon as we knew where it was we wanted to go we've been able to make real progress towards it whereas and it keeps us honest because when you get those moments of overwhelm and you're like, oh, maybe we're not getting there fast enough. Shall I do this? Shall I do that? It's like, no, stick to the journey. You've got to trust the timing and you've got to just keep moving forward. And sometimes you will have to wait for somebody else to do something. So rather than get frustrated and angry and upset, instead go, well, that's OK. I'm going to trust that they're going to be doing it. So what can I do that keeps me moving in the right direction rather than just sit here and, and get frustrated at the apparent lack of movement and where I am. And I think that's been our big learn this week, which is to go, well, okay, we can't do any more on this piece. So let's park that because that's waiting for somebody else to do it. But what we can do is start moving forward on the stuff for imposter syndrome awareness day, because there's a lot of people out there that are suffering, you know, 70% of people suffer at some point. And it's really starting to become something that gets talked about a lot more, which is a good thing. Because I think once we talk about it, once we understand it, then actually all of the science and all the psychology has told us that you can, then once you understand it, you can overcome it. And I think that's really what we're trying to help people to do, which is get out of their own way and go and lead, lead the life they want to lead. Well, I think Steve, Steve Clayton here who says drink beer. Drinking beer certainly helps when you're drinking the beer. But in the, the next morning, is always a problem. And then eventually you develop a beer belly and you don't become attractive anymore. You know, life can just go downhill if you drink too much beer, really. <laughs> well, where'd you go with that? I think as my, you know, as my, uh, the saying says, everything in moderation, including moderation. I think we've just got to do what gives us joy and try and make sure that we don't let it overcome what we want. I agree. I agree. So what have you learned then this week, Kim, on top of what we just talked about? So, so I learned all of that. And then I guess it's also been a real reflection for me on how we're heading out now of, of, of lockdown and the impacts that's having. You know, my little girl is um, going to spend the Easter weekend with her with her dad, and which is great. And I love that they get to spend time together. But actually, she's become a little bit more clingy. And I was reflecting on that to understand you know, why has she become a little bit more clingy? And then I realised that, you know, she's done a year of pretty much me and the couple of people that she that she sees at nursery when she's been able to go there. Whereas before lockdown, we would have friends over at playing um, most nights or she'd go to her friends and play with them most nights. So there was more opportunity for that distance from each other. And actually, she's not had that now. And she's only four. So... That's a massive thing for her. So she now gets a bit clingy that she's going to really miss me. So actually, one of the things that we're looking forward to for her, for her independence and her development, is the fact that we'll be able to go and see family and friends. She'll be able to reassert some of that, I guess, some of that confidence that actually she doesn't need to be with you all of the time. And um, and I have to also do that for myself. You know, I realise how much actually I love having her with me and making the most of that time and, and doing things together and helping her grow. So actually I need to reassert my own independence of saying, well, it's okay to be me and be an adult. Um, and that's gonna be a bit weird. But then also I was reflecting on kind of the challenges for, for our children that are you know in their first or second year at university or in their doing their A-levels or their GCSEs and they've had such a different time that that's going to also be something to work through. How does that manifest itself for them in the future? You know, what, what is it that that's going to create for them? Because as we know from the work we've been doing, 
a lot of the challenges that we face as adults, we face them as adults because of things that happened to us when we were children uh, or when we were young adults. So, you know, we come up with our I am statements. We have pretty much identified them at, at the age of seven. We've enforced them at the age of 14 and we've embedded them at the age of 21. And if we think about the fact that, you know, for, for our children, they're going through all of this that we're trying to make sense of. And, you know, it, it makes me wonder what's you know what's it going to mean for them and actually how do we better help them how do we make sure that we give them the right tools to be able to deal with some of these things and reframe their i am statements if they're not serving them so so these i am statements for people who are, who are kind of tuning in they might not know what the hell we're talking about right i only know what an i am statement is because i've been studying with you for probably for months now yeah and and in the beginning of that, I, I took this I took this pad here and, and I made some notes. I got my old school fountain pen out and uh, kind of made a mess everywhere with the ink. But, you know, <laughs> but, but basically I was I was doing a lot of meditating. Right. And I was doing a lot of deep thinking and everything. And I was like and then every so often I'd have this thought in my head, which would say, you know, I am useless or I am um, terrible at this or I'm a loser or I'm whatever. Right. And. And I would make a note of these of these statements, and then I would and then I would rationalise with my subconscious mind. The subconscious mind, you know, according to the schooling that we're following, uh, and Jonathan Chase follows this, Britain's leading hypnotist for many years. Um, we we understand that the subconscious mind basically is a nine year old child, a bright nine year old child that actually is driving a lot of our behaviours. And also sabotaging or actually encouraging positive behaviors, depending upon how aligned we are with that subconscious child, right? So back to the I am statements and from what I understand, what I did is I literally just made a note and I was like, okay, so I wrote it down, I'm useless. And then I would go, okay, and I would actually delve back in my past and I would say, so when did that happen first? Okay, so I would... And then I would go back to that first instance in my mind, or roughly, and I'd speak to the speak to the inner child, and I say, "So, when did that actually happen?" Okay, so who said that to you? And I would and I would say, "Okay, so it it was this person." Okay, they said that to me. Okay, so now based upon my life now and the evidence and the things that I've achieved, is that true now and then i would write a few I'd, I'd write a few bits of evidence like okay so i've won this award i've done this i've achieved that and i and i do this and blah blah all right and then what i would do is i would say well based upon the evidence that i've just given you talking to my subconscious child still and then i would literally cross out that statement of i am whatever and i would replace it with a more beneficial one and and that's how i took what you taught me around these I am statements to really mean something for me and, and, and eradicate this negative programming that had basically been harming, like self-harming my life. Yeah. So that's my explanation. Yeah, no, and that's and that's a great explanation. Because I think what happens is it's not what happens, it's what made it's what we've made it mean. Um so something will happen and hopefully this resonates with people, but how often do you replay something from your past? And yet when somebody else that was there at the time replays it, they have a very different view of what happened. And that's because we don't respond to actually what's happening. We respond to what we've made it mean. And that's where the emotion gets attached. And our subconscious brain is our happiest little helper, but it doesn't understand the difference between helping and harming. So if you ask it something that's harmful to you, like I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm alone, which were my I am statement, it will go and tr find you all of the times where that were true. And it brings them back because it's trying to help. Um, so you have to then ask it the opposite question, which is, are there any times where that's not true? Because, again, it will run in not knowing the difference and it will come back with all the examples of where you were loved, you were enough, you were, um, weren't were alone. And then you can say, well, actually, I've got a new fact base then. So on this new fact base, what am I going to choose to do next? What decision am I going to make? And I think once we once we do that, and it's about conscious choice, we can really start to move the needle. And you know, we've got we're being looked after by our um, by our inner child, 
But actually our inner child just desperately wants the adult version of us to hold its hand and go, it's okay, love, we've got this. I can take over now. And once we do that, we can really start to shift our perspective. We can do things that we never thought we were going to be able to do. We never thought were possible. And we can give ourselves belief that we can do this. And also, what's the worst that can happen? That's one of the things I've probably lived my entire life doing, which is what's the worst that can happen? And can I live with it? Because as long as you can live with the worst that can happen, you can find the courage to take the leap of faith and give it a try. Very much so. It's it's absolutely fascinating. And the feeling that you get when you when you free yourself from because it's almost like you're carrying this bag of big boulders around on your back. Yeah. And that's how I can describe the feeling that it's like a feeling of release. Like once you because like I only really had two or three statements that basically were bothering my subconscious mind and that were seated in there. And I literally it probably took about 10 days for, for me to kind of go over these statements and cross them out right and and finally eradicate them because it's almost like when you first when you first bring that statement into your mind and you reflect on it it's it's like first of all there's like a realization of like oh i was saying that to myself and then it's like i'm going to deal with this now before it carries on causing me problems and then it's a case of i'm going to replace this with 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 a really positive statement and and that's so important so important and um you know i've been kind of designing this book so that it will really help people right i haven't got haven't got a title yet quite for it but it it will also contain like this perfect day process which which i've explained to you what i did and i know you have your own version of that right and 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 that's just fantastic like when you can when you can actually write out a document that you that you update every year that's what i do i basically i i list all my my goals but i don't list them as in like i want to make this amount of money and i want to do that i make them quite emotionally driven like really kind of like i can really feel you know where i'm where i am what i'm looking at what i'm doing and these kind of things and and jonathan chase the the, the hypnotist that i mentioned he really helped me to kind of go through those uh, and create the life that i want and it, it really it's really worked like i can't believe it like it's it's crazy yeah yeah well it's, i mean it's fascinating how our, how our brain works and i think when we when we think about our goals and we we really visualize them and we visualize what we're gonna what we're gonna be hearing and what we're gonna be feeling and what we're going to be saying and what, even what we're going to be smelling and tasting the more that we can actually tap into all of our senses the easier it is for our subconscious brain to understand what's important. And then it looks for those opportunities because what happens is we filter things out. If we were to sit in exactly the same room and try and describe it, we would describe it differently, not because we're liars, but because our subconscious brains will have filtered out the things that it thinks aren't important to us. Um, there's a game, it actually is called Kim's Game, where you used to have a tray of um, items and then you everyone looks at it and then you take it away and you remove one of them and people have to try and work out what it is that's been removed. And the reason that the game works is because that we will filter out things that aren't interesting to us. And therefore, we won't always know which one's a bit missing because it wasn't important to us. It wasn't of any interest at the start. And that's true of how we live our lives. So the more that we can create a, a, a 3D vision of where it is that we're heading the faster we'll get there that game is uh i was good at it when i was a kid but now i've just lost interest it's funny isn't it how you say it's not interesting some of these some of the items right but if it was your mobile phone yeah you would notice it missing immediately <laughs> but again yeah, you probably have to be surgically removed at the moment <laughs> permanently on um, but that's another thing you know I, I i'm very conscious of that i i spend a lot of time um on my phone because that you know because that's how i work but actually i also make sure that i've got real times where the phone just gets put on the side because i don't want to teach my little girl that we live our entire life like this because yeah. that's how she'll live her entire life so actually putting it down and saying no right now we're just going to play barbies or we're going to sit and do your letters or we're going to do some cooking um, but we're going to do something that takes us away from it because we all need that and i think 
we sometimes forget to do that, that it's okay to not be always available. We never used to be. I mean, when I was at school, if somebody wanted to phone you up, to, if wanted to bully you, they'd have to phone my parents and ask them to put me on the phone. <laughs> you, got that, you got that reprieve, didn't you? Because that's, you know, how's that going to work? <laughs> um, can I just chat to your daughter? I just want to, I just want to tell her that I think she's awful. Um, but now we are constantly connected and I think we need to be able to provide that space for ourselves and for our children to say, actually, we don't have to be always available. It is okay to just take some time and just be with each other or just do something else or even just be on our own. You know, it's like, I say my little girl's not here at the minute. And normally I would think, well, I need to do work. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do the other. But last night I was like, do you know what? I'm going to switch my phone off. I'm going to run a bath. I'm going to put some music on and I'm going to have half an hour and just relax and do nothing else and it felt extremely decadent you know um but actually really has helped me feel recharged and there was a reflection that actually I'm entitled to recharge myself I don't have to be always on and nothing was probably going to be disastrous that happened in that half an hour that I took um you know no one if anyone really really needed me then they would have found a way to get in touch but actually it's really, it was really beneficial to do. And I'm getting, one of my reflections is I'm going to do it more often. Yeah, you should, most definitely. Time to yourself is just, it's just, it's massively important, right? And especially with all the things that you're doing, Kim, I know you're a big believer in um, continued professional development, right? And learning throughout your life, right? Like you're massive into that, as I am. That's why we work well together, yeah? So, I know you're studying this facial course at the moment, which is it's how to read people's faces and, and, and get insights into kind of who they are as a person and how they might behave in a specific situation or what mood that they may be in, what emotions they're feeling at the time, perhaps when they had the picture taken. Because that, if that's the only thing that you see of them visually, and and I find it absolutely fascinating. So, what what do you think? Have you have you have you really kind of hit a, a good point with that course, or, or what? Yeah, it's it's fascinating. So basically, there's two elements to the course. The first one is uh, we're dealing with what what's called um, the facial action coding system, and that talks about the I think it's 49 muscle movements um, that we make that actually we all make universally in the same way when we're showing a particular emotion. So if we're happy, albeit there's 16 ways to do happy, if we're sad, if we're fearful, if we're showing contempt. Um, and being able to understand them allows us to just ask better questions. So it's not for us to be able to call it out and go, wow, Nat, you look angry. You're cheating you off today. But if, uh, if you're looking angry and you, you take that into the context, then I could go, OK, what I'm saying right now isn't landing. So instead of calling you out on it, I could just say, I just want to check, is this landing in the way that you wanted it to or were you expecting something else? You can open up a non-confrontational conversation that allows you to get to a better point. Or if somebody's really, really happy, then actually, you know, you can um, you can ask them about kind of what's going on and how, how they're feeling. So it's a really good way of being able to just adapt your conversation. And it's used in all of the facial recognition software globally. So you know, this has been around for years. It was originally designed by Dr. Urquhart, who did studies on it. But then the, the second thing that we're learning is about the personality of our faces. And this is, comes from what we look like. So for example, how widely spaced our eyes are, whether or not you can see um, a lot or a little bit of somebody's um, eyelids, um, whether or not their um, nose tilts up or tilts down, how their chin goes just gives you an idea of some of their pre um almost predetermined likelihoods of their personality now it doesn't mean to say that they will definitely be like that but that they are likely to be more like that so as an example if uh, if our eyelids are lower or eyes sorry are lower at the outer edge than they are at the inner edge then actually we're more predisposed to be critical. That doesn't mean to say we are critical, but it just allows you to go, this person is likely to be more critical, therefore they need a really compelling argument to be persuaded that actually what you're saying is based on some fact. 
So it just allows you to be better prepared in those conversations. If somebody has got a very exposed um, eyelid, then they want you to get to the point. So if you're somebody like me who doesn't have a very exposed eyelid and loves questions and is passionately curious and could literally ask questions all day, I will be very, very irritating to somebody who has got those more exposed eyelids because they just want me to get to the point. I so, want you to get to the point. <laughs> so doing that allows you to ask less questions and go, actually, what are the two or three things I absolutely need to ask for me to be able to do what I need to do? But no more than that, because actually I'm trying to get to the point to help the person. It's very interesting in how you can apply this to like meeting people, like certainly on Tinder and like for me. Well, you know, I'm single, right? So so like basically for, for me to kind of meet. So I, so I'll get a match on Tinder right? and, and reflecting on, on, on the last few weeks. Yeah, let's say. Right. It's changed my whole communication style. Right. And, and it's actually really funny, like, because, because, you know, you get this, you get this really short message and then you go and you look at the woman's face and you're like, oh, okay. So they've got like quite a lot of eyelid showing right in their, in their pictures. So then I'm like, hmm, okay. So they've got quite a lot of eyelid showing, right. So they get a, they get to want to analyze what I have to say quite, quite in depth. Yeah. Okay, but like because they've sent me a really short message, it, it, it for me that means that I need to send them a very concise message that is actually really comprehensive, and that's fascinating. When you when you get the response back, fast, it's really fascinating. Yeah. Well, yeah, because all of this is just about how do we improve our ability to communicate? Because at our core. Every human being wants to be listened to, they want to be understood and they want to be respected. So the more ways we can learn to better communicate, to understand if something's working or isn't working, then we can have more impactful conversations. And these work, whether it's in work, whether it's at home, whether it's even, even in the shop, um, when you're talking to somebody, just being able to better understand them allows you to have better conversations and removes the chances of things going badly wrong uh, you know because most arguments come down to misinformation miscommunication or misunderstanding so the more we can do to get over that to seek to always understand first then we can have those good conversations and as we said earlier in this it's not about saying we can't ever disagree but it's about saying we don't disrespect so you can have a different opinion, but doing so in a respectful way means that you won't end up in an argument. Yeah, it's very interesting. And that ties into our imposter syndrome uh, awareness day that we're launching with Lisa Ventura on the 13th of April. It's International Imposter Syndrome Awareness Day. And it's very interesting, you know, how you can actually build up people's confidence so that they can get over imposter syndrome or get over their self-confidence issues, right? When, when actually, if you treated them on, on the opposite, kind of in a nasty way, you would actually affect them. And it's, it's very interesting how you can affect people just by saying one sentence to them or one kind word and how you can kind of encourage them. It, it's fascinating. I've been doing a lot of that in the past few months and people are really coming back to me and saying, oh, you know, like my friend Maria in Italy, who's like locked down at the moment. And she's like, I'm always there for you if you ever need me. And I'm kind of like, wow, like we're Facebook friends, right? Like we've been Facebook friends for, for four or five years. And the whole thing is just quite bizarre, like how you can encourage people, you know, I mean, you and I, we come from an era, right, which is not digital. Yeah. Like, we come from the binary era, ones and zeros, yeah? But, like, I, I find the whole thing fascinating, how you can meet people online that you might never meet in person and you can build really strong relationships with them and, like, how it all just ties into encouraging them in their lives and encouraging what they're doing and stuff. It's fascinating, really. Well, no, it is, but I think that's because we... Um we eventually find we eventually find our tribe don't we we find our people that are like-minded that think like us and i've got an amazing friend sally who i've never actually met but we're really really close we've met during lockdown she's in new zealand i'm uh, in the uk but 
we've got each other's back and we're there for each other and we catch up and we check how things are going and look, look at uh, you and I you know we never we've never met actually nope. physically met and we met during lockdown on a podcast and now we work together and we chat every day and it's not just <laughs> about work it's about our lives we've become really good friends and and actually I feel like we have met even though we obviously we haven't yeah. because you build those and I think that's been one of the beauties of the lockdown is it has actually allowed us to open our horizons to go and do things that we wouldn't have done before because actually all of a sudden the world is a very very small place you know I can be in New Zealand in the morning and then have nipped over to um, Croatia and then tootle off to um, London all without actually leaving this chair <laughs> so, so you've kind of um, and it allows you to really start to connect more and I think because we are social animals and we needed to stay socially connected even though physically distanced it's actually encouraged us to have better conversations and to be a bit more understanding of the challenges because we're all facing those challenges so you know a year ago if i got interrupted because my little girl wandered in dressed as elsa it would have looked massively unprofessional whereas now a year in we all understand the challenges of what do you do when you're locked in you've got a child and you can't lock them in a room it's inappropriate you know <laughs> your children and they you know they need to be free to to live and to and to and to enjoy themselves so yes sometimes she does wander in dressed as Elsa and people have been so much more understanding and actually you know the the other day we were doing a I was doing a chairing a, a meeting and she kind of she kind of wandered in and at the very end of it they were like I can't believe you've actually managed to chair a meeting and um, also be doing um, colouring with your little girl and yet you made it look seamless and I was like well she just wanted a bit of my attention you needed me to to also be ensuring that i i was i was chairing and following it but i can do both of those it, it, it's actually easier to do both of those than it is to try and not do one of them because then she'll be very frustrated that she's missing out on time with me and it's really important to me that she knows how how much i value my time with her because i think as you know, that's one of the things that hopefully will encourage her to have great confidence um, and have positive I am statements in her future. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes about like for all relationships, right? Like really showing genuine appreciation for the relationship, friendship, work relationship and um, all, all of all of the above. Right. Like it, it just makes everything so much better. And I think we've we've become a lot more open to being a bit more touchy-feely right since all of this has happened and the corporations are encouraging people you know at the beginning of a meeting like they'll say are you okay how are you coping you know and and and, and I, I find it all quite quite fun yeah it's very positive really to be honest I'm, I'm trying to take positives from this and you know chances are we would never have, have decided to build what we're building without without this yeah so you know what can I say I'm trying to trying to focus on the positives and how when we come out the other side, what we've built and what we continue to build will really impact a lot of people's lives. And, you know, like I was talking to a lady this morning who in this networking group that you kindly uh, chaired and invited me to, masses of people there. And this lady, she's actually uh, exporting a load of medical equipment to Zambia. And I was just, and, and like she's running an auction online and I was just, and I was like, wow, like, I, I, I was like, I'm, I'm in awe of what you're doing. Like what you're doing is, is, is truly amazing. Like you should be really proud of what you're doing. And, and it, and it was just, you know, without, without this whole situation, I would never have even appreciated what she's doing and, and, and how, like what, we've still got 47% of people in the world who are not online. Right. And, and as that changes, there are going to be so many more opportunities to help people and change lives and and do more of what she's doing and like wow just just what a, what an inspirational morning's networking it was this morning really yeah no it was it was really good fun i mean i was um really proud that blessed um jill chitty who's an amazing um what kindly let me co-host well not co-host i hosted it um, while she was taking a break but it's her community and that speaks volumes i mean somebody trusts you with something that they've created that's so important to them that means the world and uh, you know and you've got to take that with great care because you know people are lending you things and I think 
know, for me, I've got complete and utter gratitude that she allowed me to do it. And then I did my best to make sure I didn't let her down and that I um, added some value to, to the group. And like you say, there are some amazing, inspiring people in there. And there's so many people in the world that are doing good right now that are trying to leave things better than they found them. And I guess for me, that's my purpose in life is how do I leave things better than I found them? Mm. And how do I how do I share some kindness? Because kindness is the thing that's going to make the biggest difference. I think it was Morgan Freeman that said, how do we change the world? One small random act of kindness at a time. And it's true because when we when we are kind or when somebody is kind to us, it sends ripples out into the world. And I think, you know, we can make a real difference. And I think that's what we're here to do. We're here to try and make a difference and to leave things better. And we do get things that go wrong. You know, I've had more than uh, more than one plot twist along the way, as we know from my, from my book title. Um, but actually all of those were lessons or blessings it took me a long time to realize that but everything in life is is either a lesson or a blessing or both and when we can look for that even when things are going horrendously wrong we can say what am i what am i learning here what am i being taught and how can i take that into my future then actually you find the strength to get through whatever the plot twist is because the other thing to remember is your ability to get through whatever the challenges are that life throws you is a hundred percent because you're here so you've already got through a hundred percent of the challenges that life has thrown at you so far and therefore you should have confidence you'll get through whatever life throws at you next if we just keep focused on that positive very much so and i think you know it's it's going to be amazing to to reflect on the year when we, you know, like I told you about my Christmas card thing, right? Yeah. Like I write myself a Christmas card every Christmas. I write myself a Christmas card for the next Christmas. Yeah. Um, and and I started that from from a friend of mine, Travis Wright. Um, fantastic idea. And and it's amazing when you can actually write yourself that that Christmas card. And I, I'm looking forward to reflecting on what we've achieved this year and how and how well we've done because we've come a long, long way. We've done so much together already. And I think, you know, we've just got to keep keep doing what we're doing and, um, you know, keep at it. And, uh, yeah, get off this live and go and do some some proper serious work, yeah? yeah no, I agree. I think we should probably stop, stop gossiping. Um, take the take the learnings for the week and move forward to the next week and um it's always a delight to chat to you hopefully it's been helpful for anybody listening and if you'd like to join us as a guest please do get in touch dm us we would love to have you here and hear what's going on in your world and what are you reflecting on that you have learned and that you've achieved and um, have an amazing easter holiday and we'll see you next week yes we will thank you kim okay. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.